So that solo worked. It was fine, but there was something uh, kind of odd about it. Do you know what it was? Hey everyone, and welcome back to another video. Phrasing. It is something that can make or break a solo. So many people work on chord tones and scales and licks and transcriptions, but their solos just still don't sound that great. One of the biggest reasons is usually one thing that's sometimes tough to practice if you're not really sure what to do, and that is phrasing. In this video, I'm gonna give you a practical exercise that you can implement right away in your playing to make your solos instantly sound better. Right before I get into it though, I have a gift for you. It's my completely free masterclass called The Best Way to Create Melodic Solos. In this masterclass, I teach you my simple voice leading process that will have you playing more lyrical and melodic solos in no time. Along with just teaching you the process, I give you some sample lines, I walk you through the entire thing, and I give you PDF worksheets as well so you can have them to work on whenever you want. The best thing, it's completely free. The only thing you need to do to get it is click the link at the top of the description down below, click the link in the pinned comment, or just go to davepollock.com slash free masterclass. All right, so how do you actually work on phrasing in a structured way so you're not just wasting time practicing? Well, first, let's focus on one of the most important aspects of phrasing, and that's the starting beat of each phrase. In the beginning of this video, I played a solo over the standard blue bossa. It sounded okay and it, it worked, but like I said, something sounded a little odd about it. What it was, was I was playing two bar phrases, which works fine in a tune like this, a 16 bar song at this tempo, but I started every single phrase on beat one. So if you go back and listen to it, every two bars, I start a new phrase on beat one. It gets very repetitive, very cookie cutter, and it's very predictable and it loses any spontaneity to the sound and the feeling of the overall solo. This is something that I actually hear so much in people's solos, especially people who have worked on a lot of scales, chords, licks, like I talked about before. They focus on all those note things and then they say, okay, I see this chord, so I'm gonna start this scale here. Or I see this chord, so I'm gonna land on these chord tones. And that stuff is great and it is good to do. But this is now taking it that next step further where I'm talking about how to actually vary up these phrases in a structured way, which I'll get to in a second, to make your solos not sound so cookie cutter and predictable. So what do you do? Just start phrases on random beats and hope it sounds good? Well, I mean, I guess you could do that, but that's not very structured and you might, you know, waste a lot of time when practicing. And if you know anything about me, you know, I don't like to waste time and I don't want my students to waste time either. Instead, I have a structured way to work through this and I'm gonna jump inside that PDF to show you right now. All right, as you see, I'm inside of a PDF that I created where I'm gonna go through this process that I think will be great for you to go through. First thing I'm gonna say, disclaimer up front, if songs have not two or four bar phrases and it's not a nice 16 or 32 bar form, sure, you have to adjust it a bit. But basically the whole concept that I'm about to teach you is all about where to start each phrase. So for this first example, I'm gonna use the song Blue Bossa. It's a 16 bar song and it's on the slower side, if you play it as a normal bossa nova or something like that, it's not super fast. So I'm gonna focus on two measure phrases. We could get into odd number of measure phrases, five bar phrases, three bars. For now, we only wanna focus on one thing and that's the starting beat of each phrase. Also, when you are practicing, this goes into all of this, make sure you're only really focusing on one aspect or one element at a time. Don't say, I'm gonna work on my phrasing and also my intonation and also my harmony, and also my technique, and also my sound, blah, blah. You can't work on all of that at the same time. It's much better and much more efficient when practicing to focus on one element. So if you're out of tune, maybe just focus on just tuning and not really focused on trying to play the fastest licks in 12 keys. If you're working on phrasing, just work on phrasing. Don't focus so much on a million other harmonic things. In a minute, I'm gonna show you some examples of me playing using this process, and I'm not gonna be playing the craziest solos possible and doing the most wild lines and licks and stuff because I'm focusing on the technique. Once you ingrain that into your playing, then you can go forward and add all the cool things that you've learned to it. What we're gonna do is look at each two bar phrase, but we're gonna start at a different place in the measure for each phrase. Now it works out really well on a tune like this in a 16 bar song, that means there's eight two bar phrases. Well, there are eight eighth notes in each measure of four four. So what I'm gonna do is start each two bar phrase on each beat of the measure, starting from beat one. So the first phrase, I'm starting right on beat one. The second phrase here, you notice I'm starting on the and of one. Third phrase, beat two. Fourth phrase, the and of two. Fifth phrase, beat three. Sixth phrase, the and of three. Seventh phrase on beat four. And then finally, the eighth phrase on the and of four. 
Just so you know, I wrote them here as a quarter note if it started on a downbeat and an eighth note if it started on an upbeat. I could have put an eighth note on the downbeat too, but I just wanted to make it different. So that's why. Not that you have to play a quarter note when you start the phrase or an eighth note. You could play whatever rhythm you want. We're not talking about rhythm. We're just talking about starting beat of the phrase. So you heard my original take on Blue Bossa where I started on beat one every single phrase. What would it sound like if I followed this exact process for 16 bars? Check it out. What'd you think of that? If I didn't tell you I was doing that, would you have been able to figure that out? Like, oh, he's starting a half a beat later each phrase? Maybe, maybe not. The end goal of this, before anybody says, this is just gonna make you play cookie cutter like this. The goal is not that you're gonna take every solo now and start on beat one and then push all the phrases back. It's just forcing you and putting those parameters on you to say no. In the second phrase, you're not allowed to start on beat one or beat two or beat three. You have to start on the end of one. And what it does is it just gets you out of your normal pattern, especially if you're you're used to just starting lines on beat one and playing some scale or playing some lick. This forces you, especially look at the end, you have to wait three and a half beats before you start on the end of four here before you can even start the phrase. So what it does is it displaces it backwards. Sure, you can move this around in different ways, but I think this is the most logical and structured way that will start and it'll help you not waste time when you're trying to learn this new idea or this new skill of varying your phrasing. All right, so once you start on beat one and go to the end of four, what are we gonna do now? We're gonna take the exact same backing track, the exact same tune, everything's the same, except we're gonna go in reverse. The first phrase now, we're starting on the end of four. And you might say, why are you not starting on the end of four leading into the measure? I wanna specifically leave all this rest here because that's not normal. Normally when we start a phrase, or start, you know, the top of the tune, we like to play through that. This is forcing us to kind of sit back, wait, leave that space, then enter later. So I go through the same process, except first phrase is on the end of four, second phrase on beat four, third phrase on the end of three, and so on and so forth until the very last phrase does start back on beat one. So here's what this sounds like. Not all songs are gonna be as comfortable doing two bar phrases. Usually slower songs work better for two bar phrases, but in general, you're gonna to wanna to start stretching that out. So I found a song that has 32 measures. So now that's eight four bar phrases. What's a great standard that has 32 measures? Autumn Leaves. There's a million other standards I could have picked, all these AABA songs, eight bar chunks, eight, 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 eight. But I wanted to pick Autumn Leaves because it's a very standard tune that a lot of you probably no. So I'm going to follow the exact same process here. The only difference is each phrase is four bars long. So as you notice, four measure phrases starting on one. So there's the first phrase starts on beat one, second phrase and a one, third phrase, beat two, so on and so forth, all the way down till the final phrase here starts on the end of four in that last line. Once again, we're displacing the beginning of that phrase a little bit. And if you even look going up there, you can see how it kind of just shifts itself over to the right. Yes, we could jump around once again, we can go backwards, whatever, but I think this is gonna be the best way for you to start. It does leave you a lot of space after that first starting note because you have you know four full measures of the phrase, but once again, not always starting on beat one, especially in a song like this where usually the beginning of each phrase is the two of a two, five, one, whether it's B flat major or G minor, we're always used to starting on beat one of that two chord. You know, we're always doing that because that's how we learn lines and licks and stuff. And there's nothing wrong with that. But now we're going to push it out. And I want to challenge you to see if you can do this and actually stay strict to it. Not, oh, well, maybe that measure I'll play a grace note or a pickup. No, 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 no. Space. 
So when you get down to the last line, there's silence for beats one, two, three, and the downbeat of four. Don't play any filler there. The idea is that you're literally leaving space. So you're not allowed to play any notes. You have to start your phrase in the end of four. It's gonna start you thinking a little differently about your phrases. Check out what this one sounds like. Finally, we're here at the same thing that we just did, the four bar phrases over autumn leaves, but we're gonna start the first phrase on the end of four. So like you see, there's the first phrase, starts on the end of four, and then we're gonna back it up by half a beat until the final phrase starts on beat one. Check out what this one sounds like. gotten this far, first of all, thank you so much. And I know this exercise will help you out no matter what song you're playing, no matter what style it is, varying your phrasing and displacing it by half a beat in a very structured way is gonna give you so many new ideas and it's gonna force you to play in a different way that you didn't think of. So it's gonna kind of force that creativity or that adaptability that you have while you're improvising, which really makes it improvisational. Once you go through this process, maybe on a couple different tunes, you do some two bar phrases, you do four bar phrases, you structure it that way going up, then the end of four coming back. Now, go back and play those same songs, but just play them freely now. Don't put those parameters on. Say you can start anywhere you want. And I would recommend recording yourself too and then listening back and say, did I start all those phrases the same way I used to? Did I start them all on beat one? Did I start them all on beat the end of three? Whatever it is. Or did are they varied? So when you're playing, maybe be conscious of it, but it also might be good after doing the exercise in a structured way to then free yourself up and not even think about it, just to check yourself to see if it's actually having an effect. If it's not, it's okay, go back and then maybe work on it a little more consciously and say, okay, where did I start that phrase? What should I start the next phrase on? And then kind of edit it from there. Here's what it sounds like when I play a couple courses of Autumn Leaves, just thinking freely about the phrasing and where I'm starting each phrase. Check it out. Bye. 
hope you enjoyed this lesson video and I hope that you take the time to put this exercise into your practicing because I know it's gonna make you sound much better. If you try to do it just in your head and it's getting a little confusing, you can write it out on a sheet of paper the way I did on whatever song you're doing or above the lead sheet. You can write, oh, in this measure, start on beat one, this measure, the end of one. If that helps you better, if you're reading a sheet music, for example, if you're reading a lead sheet or something, but you can just do it in your head. You can write it down, whatever you want, or you can pick certain phrases, especially if it's not standard two and four by phrases, where you wanna start on one, and a one, beat two. But the important thing is to actually go through that process, even if it feels a little uh, tedious, going through it, taking the time, the little bit of time that it takes to do this will be worth it in the long run because you're not just randomly trying to play things and just hoping they work. If you're watching this video, the day it comes out, Friday, February 9th, I have something really exciting to share. Tomorrow, Saturday, February 10th, I'm gonna be doing a live clinic down in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania at the Pennsylvania Convention Center. It's part of the National Jazz Festival, which is a national high school jazz festival for schools all across the nation. There's gonna be over 50 schools there, well over a thousand students playing, and it's gonna be a really great day. But I'm gonna be giving a clinic called Jam Session 101. What's really cool is I'm gonna be hosting a jam session, and I call the clinic Jam Session 101 because what I'm gonna be doing is not only just having fun playing tunes with everybody, but I'm gonna teach you jam session etiquette. You know, that's all something that should be taught talk about how to actually get the most out of a jam session as a player, but then also just as an audience member. What do you do if you go there and every tune that they call, you don't know? What do you do? Or what if you know certain tunes in different keys? Or how do you structure it if there's seven saxophone players up there? Who should take the melody? Should you play background lines? Should you trade with the drummer? All those things I'm gonna talk about while we have fun at a jam session. It's mainly for high school kids, like I said, at the festival, but it's open to the public. So if you're around, you wanna come out and hang and say hi, bring your instrument or not, it's up to you. It's gonna be, like I said, room 123 at 11.45 a.m. till about 12.45 on Saturday, February 10th at the Pennsylvania Convention Center. Look forward to seeing you there. Last thing, don't forget to check out my free masterclass called The Best Way to Create Melodic Solos. Once again, the link to that is in the description down below, also in the pinned comment, or just go to davepollock.com slash free masterclass. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.